Welcome back to Finweek Money Matters. Good ideas often crash and burn due to a lack of funding. What can inventors and entrepreneurs do to get funding to develop a prototype that could change the world? Ice Slices is an example that took many years and an incredible journey, as well as some funding from the IDC. But today, Ice Slices can be found in beauty salons around the world. We talked to Ice Slices inventor Karen Krauser Neufeld on the hoops she had to jump through to develop her prototype. We also welcome Christia van Heerden, Finweek.com editor, to the conversation. And Gavin Samanovis is still with us. Thank you so much uh, for joining us at the desk. Perhaps let's uh, come to you first, Karen. What is the most difficult aspect of getting ice slices onto the shelf? I think the development process, so in the technology space specifically, those who've got engineering or very technical types of products, um, the, the journey, the development journey is very long, um, often longer than you anticipate, and it often costs you a lot more than you anticipate. Gavin, do, do you think in South Africa we have the space that allows for the trial and error that Karen might obviously had to go through and the incubation of ideas before they can be put out to market? We don't really. We don't have that infrastructure to enable small seed stage, seed stage ideas mm. to develop, to experiment, to see what's working, what doesn't. Uh, it's typically a very expensive process and there's very little funding, particularly at that life stage of the idea. Karen, uh, sorry. Karen, what excites me about your, about your story is the fact that you mentioned from the very beginning you had government funding. What did you have to do to get that? What process did you have to go through to get government funding for an, an idea, basically? One of the challenges on the local market is that people don't know where to look and what's available. In those days, there were a lot of segmented little funds and I had to navigate the minefield of finding them. Very importantly uh, for entrepreneurs is to firstly understand what the mandate of the fund is. So are they funding research? Are they funding a prototype? Are they funding mm. process development? Are they funding commercialization or IP protection? A lot of entrepreneurs don't want to do that research. They need to understand what the mandate is and then complete the forms or the business plan um, structure according to what that mandate is. So they're speaking to that mandate. Gavin, from your experience, what would you advise entrepreneurs to do as their first port of call? Um, when you think you have a fantastic idea and whether you think it's an invention or just an innovation on an existing product or process, what's the first thing you should be doing? So the very first thing people should be doing is testing their assumptions. So you make certain assumptions about what you think the market will like, that they'll like your idea, that there'll be certain aspects of it that you think are brilliant but no one necessarily else does. And a big mistake that, that new inventors make is they just they, they don't want to tell anyone about the idea because they think the, the intellectual property rights, right. uh, they're going to lose, they can't patent it anymore. And so they spend a lot of money patenting the idea, a lot of money getting it developed, launching it out in the market, only to find that actually the market doesn't really want the product in the first place. And that's, that's uh, a massive waste. So what you really should be doing is testing the assumptions first before you develop that prototype, before mm. you actually go out and spend a lot of money to see if there's market appetite for the particular invention that you've got. And how often do you think you should do that? Because as you go through the process, as I was doing my research, I read that as you develop your prototype, you realize that certain things work and certain things don't work, which means that, do you, or maybe I should put it to you, do you have to get people in at more than one stage to test your product? Did you do that, Karen? Definitely. Um, the minute we had our first prototype, we tested the functionality of it and even started testing things like colors or packaging or logo. But so much happens over the years and you learn so much and you're making changes and developments that it is important possibly just before you finalize packaging, for example, your, your final packaging to test that, and not just with consumers, but retailers. Mm. So we made that mistake. You want a big pack because it stands out on shelf and retailers say to you, no, 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 sorry, we're not giving you that much space. Yeah. You need to downsize the pack. So absolutely important. Your, your, your story, Karen, is particularly interesting to me. I find it quite interesting because you actually had to exhibit good business skills to negotiate to get exclusive distribution uh, opportunities or deals or abilities on that particular technology product that you develop. Now the question is, you have an, someone who comes up with an idea, but that idea for it to be something that is meaningful to anyone, it needs to be something that's marketable, something that is that that you can that one can form a business out of. So, and I, someone who comes up with an idea is not necessarily someone who knows how to run a business. Yeah. Do you have to? 
sit back and say, right, I've got an idea, but I don't understand. The first thing about business, maybe I should speak to Chris or, or uh, Nozipo to say, actually, I've got an idea. Please, let's partner up with your business mind mm -hmm. and maybe we can make something bigger oh, of this. Absolutely. And that's where the business incubators come in. And I'm a real <coughs> advocate for the business incubators because they take in all these entrepreneurs, inventors, techie mm. people. Um, and, and hand hold you through the process. So it's not just about getting that product to market and navigating the minefield of the development stage, but also at the same time, you need to be growing yourself as a manager, a leader, leadership skills, management skills, business skills, finance skills. A lot of entrepreneurs are marketers and not finance people. Right. Uh, Gavin, maybe yeah. if I can jump in just uh, with the, the question of licensing that you, you, talk, you mm -hmm. touched on a little bit earlier. At what point should you be actively trying to ensure that you are protecting your intellectual property? All right, so I've got very different views on this to the traditional sort of patent lawyers who will say you need to patent it up front to protect it because if you tell anyone about the idea then it's not patentable. My view is that actually it's only worth protecting something that's got real market potential. And so I think what you should be doing is testing it, getting it out there, getting feedback from customers, seeing what they think, and only at the point where you've got something that you know is going to work, mm. that's the point when you should be doing as much protection as you can. I, I just want to support what, uh, what Karen was saying previously about that, that whole you know, marketing and, and uh, finance angle. You know, very often uh, entrepreneurs come up with a great idea and they think, well, um, this is brilliant, the market's, I'm just going to put it out there and the market's going to welcome it with open mm. arms. Mm. And actually, that's just the first stage, is the invention. The marketing and distribution is, is actually way more important mm. than the idea itself. Because yeah. if you don't have proper marketing and distribution, no matter how good the idea is, it's never going to work. And equally, if you've got a very mediocre product, but brilliant marketing and distribution, then right. you're going to make a, a real success of it. Let's go into the channels uh, conversation that uh, Gavin has just touched on. Now, Ice Slices is in many countries now. What are some of the hurdles that you had to navigate to actually get to that point, um, especially around how did you go about choosing your distribution partners? In the beginning, as entrepreneurs, you're too scared to say no to anything. So every inquiry that comes from any part of the world, you're jumping at. Mm. And then you quickly learn not all people are equal and that those opportunities do come around again. So you think, oh, if I don't take this inquiry from Timbuktu, I'm never going to get another one. And that's a mistake mm. we made. But as your business evolves, you start to attract a different kind of customer. So in the beginning, you'll attract a one man or a family type business that sees something in your invention and, and, and want to take it to market or build a business for themselves in their country. And as your business grows and as you learn and as it evolves, and as your systems improve and as your leadership and management skills improve, you start to attract serious companies yeah. right. that then want to partner with you. What I found, sorry, Go Sandy Caesar, what I found really interesting about your story is that you mentioned that you got international distribution before the product actually found its feet locally. Yes. Why don't you tell us about that? There's a whole debate on, I've had so many people say you cannot build a global brand unless you're successful in your local market. And for us, our story didn't happen that way. And I think <clears throat> my encouragement to entrepreneurs is that everybody's journey is going to be different. You can take the theory and it's not always going to work out that way for you. And so um, for us, the international markets being such a technologically advanced product, were more ready for us than our local market. And if we didn't go for the international market, we wouldn't be standing here today because we wouldn't have sustained our sales. Mm -hmm. And being a one product company, we have to do volumes to be a sustainable business. And, and we, we went to the international markets and we learned, but we had put very strong foundations, <coughs> excuse me, in place, excellent packaging, excellent production. We were GMP compliant and uh, one of those, um, things that entrepreneurs have to do is look at the end point and say, if we're going to be a global player, we're not going to take shortcuts. We're not going to print labels off our computer and make a homemade bottle. Um, we're going to be GMP compliant so that when the international customers knock on our door, we're ready. We've got the paperwork in place. We've got the testing. We comply legally to the international regulations. Kevin. Now, she, she talked about being scared when you are an up-and-coming entrepreneur. And chances are, when you're looking for funding, you're not going to just turn away people that are coming to say, actually, I've got some cash, I can fund your business, I can fund your idea. You will take almost anyone that comes. How dangerous can that be in the long run? Because chances are, you might end up taking partners with you that will simply mm -hmm. just 
bulldoze you off your own business or off your idea in sure. the long run. It's crucial. And in fact, you have to think about your investor more carefully than you think about your wife. Because you're going to be with them for the long term. Don't say you that on you, are, you are very lucky that Colette is no longer at the desk. I bet you my last 50 cents, you wouldn't have said that five minutes ago. Well, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's lots of horror stories out there of people who've, who've taken money from investors, the relationship soured, um, and then you're in a lot of trouble because very often the investor has more power in the relationship than you do. Mm -hmm. There's lots of stories of entrepreneurs who started companies, uh, things didn't go well, and they end up actually getting pushed out by the investors mm -hmm. because investors didn't have faith mm -hmm. in, in their management abilities or the other skills that Karen was talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's very dangerous. And sure. if you don't get on with your investor, it's doomed from the start. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we have to wrap this conversation, but before we do, uh, uh, Gavin, I want you to talk to us about something I'm sure that Karen had to take on, but. Uh, hers obviously has turned out in a different way. When is it time to give up? You know, oftentimes you hear entrepreneurs coming up with one thing or another, but surely there must be a strong indicator that, okay, this is not going to work. Yeah. So, so the general advice to entrepreneurs is you need to persist, you need to push through, keep going, keep going, keep going. And that's actually very dangerous advice. Because if you're on the wrong path to start off with, if you have a product that actually there's no product market fit between, there's no fit between your product and the market, and people keep telling you they don't want it, and you keep persisting, you're just gonna lose everything. You actually have to say, well, what are the assumptions I have about my product or my business? Test those out in the market, and if those are proving inaccurate or invalid, people are saying things that you don't wanna hear, that's the time to change and to pivot, to, to do something different until you get that positive feedback from the market. And that's when you push through. Mm. Thanks to our guest, Karen Krauss, a new CEO and inventor of Ice Slices, and Gavin Samanovitz, owner of FeedbackRocket.com, and the guy who is in trouble with his wife, Colette, <laughs> now. But before we head off to an ad break, let's get into our Befriend the Trend segment. Now, a recent study has shown that a quarter of mobile users fell victim to cybercrime last year. Today's Befriend the Trend looks at the faults and causes of this phenomenon. Uh, let me first come to you, Christian. This you might have some views. Um, do we have an understanding of how big cybercrime is in South Africa? Not even close. Not even close. I was actually amazed at the statistics. First of all, we are the third biggest victim of cybercrime South Africa in the world after Russia and China. Um, secondly, 50% of all targeted attacks, cybercrime attacks last year were at small businesses. And the growth area in cybercrime attacks focuses on businesses with fewer than 250 employees, which means if you go through this whole process of starting your business up and you've now gotten to a point where you can actually employ people, it could literally take a single cybercrime attack to floor you completely. It's terrifying. But I'm also thinking as we install new apps and we latch onto the latest technological devices that come, it seems as if we're opening ourselves even more to, to, to cybercrime. And yet, at the same time, there's a big thing that says, you know, if you don't get onto the technology train, you're going to be left behind. You know, what should businesses be doing? How do you strike a balance? Look, there are quite a few things that you could be doing. There's a lot of information available on it. I think the biggest mistakes businesses make is to think that it won't affect them, because it will. At some point, it will affect you. There are 250,000 new viruses developed daily across the world, and you, I mean, you will be a target of an attack if you don't, if you're not careful. And, and very quickly, I mean, one would think if we're sitting third uh, on the list, this would be a big factor to deter investors from coming into South Africa. Have we seen any sentiments of that nature? Not, not yet, not as far as I can tell. But the, the prevalence of cybercrime is also a massive opportunity for South Africans, for small business owners, for matriculants who's looking to get a job that could take them across the world, uh, for people providing education on cybercrime. There's, there's a huge gap in the market to address this problem and I think that is what, what small businesses should start looking at.